Welcome everyone to this installment of the Air Fuel Alliance Wireless Power webinar series. We are going to go ahead and get started. Uh, a reminder on our webinars, all, all participants' microphones have been muted. Please send questions to the host at any time using the Q&A function, uh, not the chat function as we don't, we won't be monitoring that. Uh, and we'll answer questions at the end of the presentation. The Air Fuel Alliance is a global coalition of innovative companies committed to a world where we can power up without plugging in. Uh, Air Fuel leads standards development for leading edge wireless power technologies and acceleration of their development. Uh, Air Fuel has a diverse membership representing the full spectrum of the wireless power value chain. You can learn more at our website, airfuel.org. Summarizing the, uh, the breadth of the air fuel uh, ecosystem, uh, we have member companies ranging from semiconductors to components to testing and certification, reference designs, production, uh, resonators and materials and engineering support, really covering the full gamut of the uh, wireless power value chain. And in today's webinar, we're gonna be walking through step-by-step -step preparing your product for electromagnetic compatibility or EMC. And presenting this topic today is Kai Seeley, uh, Senior Principal Engineer at Yatricity. So I'm going to hand it off to Kai. Thank you, Tommy. Uh, it's good to be with everyone today. Um, I look forward to discussing a little bit more about EMC and uh, electromagnetic compatibility and, and what that means. So hopefully some of you had the opportunity to see my last webinar, which was about EMF. And I'm often asked the question, what is the difference between EMF, EMI, RFI, EMC? What are all these EM acronyms? And the answer um, depends on what you're using it for. In this case, most people are referring to regulatory issues. So when we talk about EMF, it's really talking about human safety or RF exposure uh, with respect to regulatory. Um, and EMI or RFI, both of these uh, acronyms are used often, they're, they're synonymous. Electromagnetic interference or radio frequency interference it refers to radio interference um, with respect to how your product does or does not interfere with other incumbent radio services. And then finally, EMC, or electromagnetic compatibility, is a broader term referring to how to get your product compatible to meet these EMI limits. So in today's webinar, we're gonna focus on discussing EMI, RFI, and EMC, more particularly radio frequency interference. So in understanding EMC, the key to success is really following a four-step four method. And um, what I wanna do is describe to you a little bit about how you can make your product successful when it comes to EMC issues. So the first step, and people often take this for granted, but it really is understanding EMI. What is EMI? What is EMC? What types of emissions are there? Uh, what kinds of or modes of emissions there are, how the test setup and the method for testing works, because that also influences um, how you design your product. And then finally, there are regional limits and procedures that you need to be aware of in order to design your product to ensure that you meet the EMI limits or to be EM electromagnetic compatible. Okay, so once you understand the EMC process, then it's really down to mitigation. And in my mind, there are really two steps to mitigation, step two and three, mitigation in design. That means when you're design, designing your schematics and even when you're performing a layout or designing your wiring or your system uh, connectivity, all of these have to consider EMC in the very beginning. If you don't, you're gonna make it more difficult on yourself when you push the product. 
So mitigation and design is important. I rec recognize that uh, a historic method for um, designing electronics is you have an engineer perform the schematic and then you have a layout person, a draftsman, do the layout for printed circuit boards. And this can be a simple way to get your product working, but oftentimes uh, engineers are the ones who understand electromagnetic compatibility. And so you need some interaction on the layout as well. And then as you move towards product, and you're measuring your system, you're going to find some cases where you maybe don't meet the EMI limits. And we'll talk more about those limits and, and what modes of EMI and types of EMI there are. But you're going to have to measure, you're going to tweak. And when you tweak your system to pass one limit, there's this issue that comes up in most uh, EMC design issues, and that is a ballooning. So you solve one problem and it leads to another problem and you're often going around trying to solve each of these uh, particular issues, be it harmonics or whatever they are. And so you have to go through this measure, tweak and repeat process and figure out the best way to mitigate your EMI problems. Once you've got a product that meets those limits, then you bring it to certification or depending on your region, you declare it as meeting specific standards. So we'll talk a little bit at the end about uh, regional requirements, um, regulatory bodies. Is it a regulatory issue or is it a self-declaration issue? What kind of documentation or authorization is required? So this is the EMC path to success. Now, it, it would be amiss of me if I didn't mention what a lot of product designers are doing today and why there's so much failure in the EMC um, testing and certification process. That really comes down to the fact that many people don't start with EMC in mind in the beginning. In fact, what usually happens is you start designing your wireless power transfer system because that's challenging enough. You go through and, and you meet all of your functional requirements for your manager or your client. And then once you meet those functional requirements, someone says it needs to be more robust. So then you focus on making it robust. You go through all this work, it takes a long time. And then finally, someone says, okay, now it's time to bring it to product. So you take it to a test lab and all of a sudden you find out you have some issues in your product design. You thought you had complete your design, but no matter, what you're going to do is hire a consultant and have them help you suppress these particular emissions issues. And once you do that, you're going to go to certification, right? Well, it turns out, especially for wireless power, that is really not a path to success because even EMC experts don't fully understand wireless power. And so you need to consider it in the very beginning. And that is what we're going to talk about today, making sure you understand what EMC is and how you can mitigate it up front. So in terms of types of EM disturbance, uh, there are really two types that are measured in uh, most regulatory standards. The first is radiated emissions. These are uh, usually far field emissions that are radiated from your product. And when we talk about products in the testing and certification world, this is usually called equipment under test or your device under test, EUT or DUT. You'll see both of those used depending on the standards that you're using. And your product or wireless power transfer product as a DUT will emit radiated emissions. Okay, All electronics do for the most part, and certainly they emit conducted emissions also. Now, conducted emissions are a little different than radiated emissions they're conducted on the line back to the AC mains. Not all products connect to the AC mains, but a lot of them do. And if it connects to AC mains, you need to measure the conductive emissions as well as the radiated emissions. So let's talk about how these are measured, and then that will bring us into what the different kinds or modes of emissions are and, and mitigating each of those. So the first one, is the testing setup for a conducted emissions um, test. Now, this is pretty common globally in how you would perform 
uh, conducted emission testing. Basically, you set your DUT on an isolated table. You um, try to ensure that the radiated emissions aren't prominent, uh, and what you're measuring specifically is the conducted emission. So you attach the power AC mains to a LISM a line impedance stabilization network. Now what this does is it provides some filtering from the AC main supply from the wall and it ensures you have a, a fairly clean signal and then it pulls off any emissions that are conducted from the device under test and it reads it into a spectrum analyzer or an EMI receiver. A lot of modern spectrum analyzers have these EMI receivers built in. And basically all that means is it has the software to perform these standardized tests, which end up being uh, what we call quasi-peak or average uh, measurements. Now, when you think about this setup, especially for wireless power transfer systems, you also need to consider, and many test labs might not, so you need to help the lab consider that wireless power transfer does have some localized fields, right? And because of that, you need to ensure that the LISN itself is appropriately, appropriately grounded and that the AC mains going into the LISN, that would be this little AC mains here, is appropriately shielded so that what doesn't happen for wireless power transfer systems, you don't want it to be coupled in here and have those radiated emissions show up as conducted into the LISM. I have seen that happen before, so it's important that uh, the test lab does everything in their power to make sure what they're measuring is purely conducted emissions. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the radiated emissions testing setup. Now this is a little bit different. What we do here is we measure with an antenna the device under test and the device under test is usually rotated. So it, it spins around um, and at each angle you measure the radiated emissions. This is because uh, for a given frequency you might have a radiation pattern that it, it comes out of your device and the limits are specified in terms of the maximum emission, no matter what direction that is, the maximum emission and polarization from your device under test must meet the EMI limits. Now, when you're talking about measurements between nine kilohertz and 30 megahertz, typically that antenna will be a loop antenna and above, uh, 30 megahertz, it's going to be an E-field type antenna, like a monopole, monopole or a directional antenna um, that measures the E-field in the, in the far field. So typical testing distances for these types of emission testings are three meters or 10 meters. Uh, those are the most common. Sometimes um, you can choose and other times it's specified by the standard. So we'll talk a little bit about those. And in some cases, the limits are specified at even greater distances. For example, 30 meters or 300 meters. And so the test lab may not have that kind of testing space. And so they'll scale the measurement down to the appropriate distance. And there's a way that that's done as well. So this, these are the testing setup for um, radiated and conducted emissions. And that's how that works. Now that you understand a little bit about the types of emissions, let's understand a little bit more about modes of emissions. Now, modes of emissions, at the end of the day, emissions are caused from current flow. And this is important to, uh, to recognize, okay? So when we talk about conducted emissions, it's current flow that's occurring uh, at the power supply with respect to the AC mains grid, right? So what kind of emissions are occurring there? When we talk about radiated emissions, it's emissions that are coming off of the printed circuit board, off of wires, off of lines that are acting as mini antennas in essence. And how those are radiated depends a little bit about the antenna themselves. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as well. So when it comes to differential mode emissions, this is the most 
uh, commonly understood. I think most engineers come understand differential emissions. This is your uh, conventional current flow when you have a current and there's a loop, which is required for a circuit design, right? Then you have emissions of some sort, and these are differential mode emissions. Okay, so the the current it flows in one direction, as you see here. Okay. The other kind of emissions, which is often less understood and a little bit more mysterious in some respects, is common mode emissions or common mode noise. In this case, you have an additional loop that occurs somewhere within the system. And when it comes to um, emissions in the AC mains, usually that loop is the reference earth ground. So these emissions, and it's not saying that all currents flow like this, it's saying that currents at certain frequencies may flow like this. You get current that goes in the same direction, in or out of the circuit, and then you have a separate loop where current is flowing that maybe you don't intend to be flowing there, or perhaps um, it's uh, just simply misunderstood why the current's flowing there. But those common mode emissions um, exist um, across many electronics, and they're very ubiquitous in switch mode power supplies and uh, wireless power transfer systems. So you need to understand those as well, okay? So let's talk a little bit about the easy one first, the causes of differential disturbance and especially as it relates to wireless power transfer, okay? So what are some of the causes of differential um, emissions, both conducted and radiated? Well, the fundamental frequency, there's usually a fundamental frequency with wireless power transfer, right? And then you have some harmonics. Those harmonics are caused by the fact that when you want an efficient wireless power transfer system, you're using an inverter that is offering operating in a switch mode condition. Also, on most electronics, you have some switch mode power supplies as well, and they might be secondary to the wireless power transfer. They might be powering low power circuits or other aspects of your design, okay? But because they are switch mode, they are operating and have a fundamental frequency and often harmonics as well. And so each of these has to be considered in differential disturbance when you're talking about emissions. Now, differential emissions, it's really the inductances that matter. And what I mean by inductances are parasitic inductances and more particularly loop area. Okay, so you do not want large loop areas in your design. Usually this is not a schematic issue. It comes down to a layout or wiring issue. And so this is one of the things that happens when you have a poor PCB layout. You might have the best schematic in the world for your particular design, but if it's not laid out well in the printed circuit board, or if the system isn't connected, considering all of these loop areas, then you're going to have some radiated or conducted emissions that you don't expect. Okay, and it can also affect, especially in switch mode designs, even your uh, switching transitions that might add additional frequencies that you weren't planning on, uh, small resonances and so forth. So uh, where do these differential emissions come from? Well, oftentimes they're unshielded inductors or um, more particularly, as you can see in this little diagram below, it might come even through the wireless power transfer coil as well. Not all of them do, and you shouldn't assume that all of them do, but differential, because you have some differential current and coil and coil current flowing, you're going to get a localized field, and at some point, you're going to have some of that be radiated, and that radiated EMI um, and even conducted EMI back to the through the AC mains uh, has to be mitigated. So differential mode emissions are proportional, in essence, to the electrical loop area. So you need to keep that in mind. Now, let's, let's look at differential signals in the time domain to kind of understand this a little bit better. Let's say we have a wireless power transfer system, 
that's operating from a, what we call a differential class D amplifier. So it produces a semi-square wave. It's kind of trapezoidal in nature. And that's a voltage that appears on the output of the amplifier, okay? Now, in a resonant, magnetic resonant wireless power transfer system, this square wave as a voltage potential goes through a resonant um, matching or impedance matching network. And when you measure the current into the coil, it looks sinusoidal. And you'll notice I have, in this case, um, two different designs for a matching network, and they both look sinusoidal, okay? This is despite the fact that I have a square wave input. You'll notice that this isn't a perfect square wave. The reason is is because the way I've designed the square wave in the simulation is by creating a Fourier series of sine waves up to um, the 59th or uh, harmonic that basically represents the input. So that's a good representation of the square wave in the frequency domain. And when we look at this, okay, you may, you may take your oscilloscope, measure the current, and say, I don't understand why I have emissions that are outside of the fundamental frequency when my current looks sinusoidal. Well, that's the benefit of magnetic resonance, and it, not all induction systems or wireless power induction systems look like that, but it is a benefit for magnetic resonance but we shouldn't make assumptions based only on what we see in the time domain. So this is the frequency domain. We have the coil current um, in relative magnitude on the uh, y-axis, and then the x-axis is frequency. And if you look at the harmonics, um, square waves produce odd harmonics in this case, so that's why we see odd harmonics. Each of those numbers represents the harmonic number. Okay, and if I look at the series matching example, so this is the first go-to design that many people use when they design a resonant wireless power transfer system, is they put a, some series capacitors in series with the coil and they say uh, match it to the appropriate resonance and they um, then tune their amplifier to produce uh, the current that's needed. And when you do this, it looks sinusoidal, but in the frequency domain, you'll notice that it's not always equivalent, okay? So when we're up at the 59th harmonic, for example, which is around 400 megahertz, right? Uh, you may be, in this case, your differential signals might be 120 dB down, and this is for ideal inductors and capacitors. Whereas if you choose another type of matching network, you might be as low as 160 dB down, right? That's, that's a 40 dB difference. That's more than a 40 dB difference there. That can make a huge difference when it comes to EMI, okay? So the level of high order harmonics are affected by the impedance matching topology and amplifier design when you are thinking about your differential emissions. Now, it turns out that differential emissions in terms of preventing them and kind of solving these issues is a little more challenging for low frequencies than it is for high frequencies. Why is this? Because you need larger passive components such as inductors and capacitors to manage your differential filtering, right? So lower um, frequency designs usually have larger um, larger inductors and larger capacitors. We see this often the time in switch mode design. Many switch mode power supplies are moving from low frequency to high frequency for exactly this reason, because those components are so large and we want to, them to take up as small a space as possible uh, in our power supply, so we increase the frequency. Similar things are happening for wireless power transfer. So as you're considering differential disturbances, what are some of the things you can do? Well, you can start off by looking at the amplifier topology, okay? So there are many different kinds of topologies you can use that are switch mode topologies that are very efficient for wireless power transfer. The class E amplifier is one example. The class D is another. So on the left-hand side here, this is uh, what we consider a class D amplifier, and it's a, a single-ended class D amplifier. 
you know, when you make it differential, you add two more switches. Okay. Whereas on the right hand side is a classic class E amplifier. And then there are some other amplifiers as well that consider specific harmonics. And these amplifiers um, have different characteristics when it comes to differential mode emissions. Their waveforms do not look the same. For example, the class E amplifier does not look like a square wave, whereas the class D does. Okay, so their modes of emissions and the um, harmonics of the emissions will change with the amplifier topology that you choose. So you need to consider this up front, not only just in efficiency and other factors, functional factors, but also how it affects your EMC design. Matching network, as we just discussed, is the other issue, right? There are many different types of resonant mode filters and different behaviors that you get out of different types of matching. Okay, so the order of the, the resonant filter and uh, impacts the harmonics as well as any other frequencies that may get through um, in conducted ways through your design, be it power supply, switch mode converters and so forth. And so you need to consider how well of a filter your resonant um, system is as well as the impact of changing impedance on that, right? That's, that's kind of a different issue, but it all works together functionally and for EMC. So consider that up front. And then finally, when it comes to design of your wireless power transfer system, uh, there are filtering options. So that kind of goes along with resonant filter, but you might be filtering in other locations on your board. Like, uh, for example, you might have ferrite beads or uh, other inductors and capacitors or other filters uh, to help mitigate some of your conducted emissions on your board that can end up being radiated um, from your board or, or wires uh, protruding from your board. Shielding, what's shielded on your board, um, what's not, that will make a difference. And then uh, your layout, as we talked about. At the end of the day, when it comes to differential disturbance, you need to minimize your loop area. You need to minimize your parasitic capacitances. When it comes to amplifiers, where I see the biggest problems are loops in the amplifier design. So you often don't consider how large a loop is between your switch mode components and your output or something like that. And this can cause radiated emissions that you weren't planning on. So by shielding that or by reducing the loops, and there are significant um, benefits to reducing the loops, um, then that will help significantly. So what are some causes of common mode disturbances for wireless power transfer? This is one that's a little um, more challenging to a lot of people because it's harder to understand and it's harder to model, quite frankly. So we'll talk about that as well. The biggest issue I see for common mode disturbance really comes down to asymmetry at the end of the day. Asymmetry in the amplifier design asymmetry in matching topologies, or even down to the coil geometry that's used for the wireless power transfer system, asymmetric coil design, okay? All of these reduce, um, basically cause parasitic imbalance, parasitic capacitances, which we'll talk about some more, and that asymmetry results in currents flowing in locations that you do not expect. And as a result, you get both radiated emissions from it and conducted emissions that are common mode emissions, okay? At the end of the day, the common mode um, issues come down to parasitic capacitances as opposed to inductances in the differential issue, parasitic capacitances or line links, um, and the common mode emissions are effectively proportional to the electrical line length be that a trace, a wire, or et cetera, okay? So again, PCB layout can be uh, an issue for uh, common mode emissions. Grounding is a huge one. Grounding is misunderstood often. And so you get ground loops or other things that end up resulting in common mode emissions. Uh, shielding, okay? Shielding can be both positive and negative. 
It can help to reduce radiated emissions, but at the same time, it can cause common mode emissions because you might have current flowing on the outside of those shields when you least expect it, and it's capacitively coupled to the shield. So that, in turn, can enhance emissions in some cases. This is some of that ballooning effect. You may solve a differential emission, and you might have a common mode emission that pops up when you do it. So you need to consider all of these common uh, causes when it comes to emissions. So just to take an example, let's look at uh, the parasitic consideration of a wireless power transfer system, okay? We have two uh, amplifier and a wireless power transfer designs kind of shown in a high-level diagram here. On the left, we have uh, an asymmetric, unbalanced, single-ended design. Okay, this is how you would design it from a schematics point of view. And if you put both of these into uh, a SPICE program, you would get the same result, right? But let's talk about some of the differences, okay? So in the asymmetric design, you're only focused on your filter as it uh, is from a single-ended point of view. You have your coupling coil to a PRU, and um, then you get your power out of your wireless power transfer system. In the symmetric balance differential design on the right, it's effectively the same, right? If you uh, take this inductance here and you double it, it'll be the same inductance that you have over here, okay? If you take the capacitance here and you have it, it'll be the same effective as the single-ended design, right? This is why SPICE in SPICE, these two designs look equivalent. But let's look a little bit quick, uh, closer about the reality of these systems, okay? As soon as you lay out these systems in a printed circuit board and connect your wiring, you have parasitic capacitances that exist, okay? You have self-resonances that occur in the inductors, okay? And, and at some point, they actually look like capacitors. Then you have these little capacitors that exist on the traces between the matching network, between the PRU and the PTU, the power transfer unit, the power receive unit, and even between earth ground in some cases. So a user comes and puts their hand on the device and you get a loop back to the power transfer unit, okay? And so if many of you have ever tested, um, say, uh, a wireless power transfer design that's in a prototype stage, and you put your hand on the PRU and suddenly the voltage changes and you scratch your head, why is this occurring? Usually this is the reason. You have some uh, parasitic capacitance, an electric field that's induced, and basically it's caused by common mode unbalanced design. On the right-hand side, however, even though these parasitic capacitances exist, the balance means that they sometimes cancel out, or at least to some extent possible when it's properly balanced. The current through this capacitor, as an example, and this capacitor should be about equal and opposite, right? So it can help cancel out some of those current uh, common mode emissions. Now, these problems uh, are caused by asymmetry at the end of the day, and it is more challenging in this case for high-frequency designs because the parasitic capacitance, capacitances are, become more dominant uh, the higher in frequency you go, right? So how do we prevent these common mode disturbances? And this is one of the things that you'll fight against um, as you do higher and higher frequency uh, wireless power transfer or, or anything for that matter. So you need to consider your symmetry first and foremost. Your differential amplifier and matching network, is it symmetric? In the Air Fuel Alliance, we have the baseline system specification for the magnetic resonance wireless power transfer. Um, and in there, we have some recommendations. For example, it's a requirement that the amplifier utilize balanced matching network. And this is why, 
we, we want to help you up front by minimizing these common mode currents. Also, we want to minimize the effect that a human in the loop causes when you put your hand on that wireless power transfer device. We don't want that to be the cause of changing voltages and powers. That doesn't make a lot of sense. Okay, so we need to minimize these common mode currents. And, um, and the way to do that is symmetry. The other recommendation we have in that baseline system specification is to have uh, a coil geometry that is rather uniform in its geom geometry or symmetric in its geometry. Why does this matter? Well, it turns out if you, in a common coil, if you just wind it inward, as you go along the length of that coil, you're gonna have a different voltage with respect to the earth ground, okay? And those different voltages mean that you might have a higher electric field in some cases. By making it uniform, you reduce the electric field potential and the potential for common mode emissions uh, between the PRU that you're using and the PTU and anything else that's interacting. So that's why symmetry is important, okay? The other thing you can do is to really think about your design. Inductors are not really ideal, especially the higher frequency you go. You can't just put an inductor in your system that's rated at low frequency with a specific inductance. You need to consider the parasitic capacitances of those inductors, okay? And that's a self-resonance of the inductor. So you need the self-resonance to be as high as possible. The same goes for the PTU resonator coil, okay? By having higher self-resonances, you're gonna have less electric field, uh, which will help in EMI. You're gonna have also um, uh, better filtering, right? So all of those things are important. And for the PTU resonator coil, you're going to have a higher quality factor if your self-resonance is higher. Okay, so that doesn't come into play. And then finally, uh, on the design side, when mitigating common mode disturbance, many, many uh, designs have common mode chokes in them. Sometimes on the wiring, it'll be a ferrite clamp. Um, sometimes they'll be looped, sometimes it won't. And oftentimes in the design itself, there are conducted common mode chokes and other techniques you can use. But at the end of the day, again, common mode disturbance come down to minimizing line, line lengths wherever possible. So let's talk a little bit about the uh, regulatory regional requirements. So now that we kind of understand causes of emissions, we understand some ways to mitigate them for wireless power transfer, you're, you're ready to take your product, you've gone through the testing process, what are the actual requirements? What do you test to to make sure you're going to pass? Well, the first thing you need to know is that it depends on the region or the country in which you're operating, okay, and or selling your device. And depending on that region, it will either be an authorization or it will be a self-declaration, okay? There are two different um, general different modes. I'm gonna focus on two regions that are uh, maybe the most common for um, issues or trying to understand issues. The, the United States of America, for example, requires authorization for wireless power transfer system. In fact, the Federal Communication Commission, the FCC of the US is the authorizing agent for the United States. And they put out what's called a KDB, a knowledge database article, 680106. And you can look this up. That is specifically related to authorization for wireless power transfer systems. And there's an attachment at the bottom of that KDB that you should also read. It talks about EMF and EMI and what's required to get your wireless power transfer system authorized, okay? Now, the European Union, on the other hand, is a little bit different. Instead of an authorizing agency, the EU requires a self-declaration, so it's a self-declaration uh, process. And there are uh, directives associated with that declaration. And I'll talk a little bit more in depth about the, 
the one, two, three steps for how to ensure that you meet the directives. But basically those directives come down to three different directives, the radio equipment directive, the electromagnetic compatibility directive, that should say electromagnetic compatibility, and the low voltage directive, okay? And so you need to check your regional requirements when you're thinking about certifying. But to make this a little more complicated, and, and hopefully I can simplify this for you, how do you know which EMC limits apply? Because when you dig into these uh, authorizations, you'll see, and I'll show you in a minute, that different limits apply depending on how your system operates and what type of a device it's considered, okay? Most uh, countries either consider a wireless power transfer system as an ISM device, which is industrial scientific medical device, or a short range radio device. And it turns out that it does make a difference and it's important to distinguish, okay? Now, generally speaking, a wireless power transfer system is an ISM device, okay? And this is a hotly debated topic so I'm giving you my view on this topic, and I have studied it extensively and would be happy to discuss it with anyone. But in the ITUR radio regulations, you'll see the definition of ISM applications, okay? Basically, a wireless power transfer system generates and uses radio frequency energy locally, okay? And it is not used for telecommunication purposes at least in all of the wireless power transfer applications and standard applications I'm aware of. So WPT is an ISM device unless you use the wireless power transfer fundamental field for purposes of telecommunications. And in that case, it's considered a short range device radio. Okay. So how do we distinguish whether or not telecommunications is occurring in the wireless power transfer field? Well, this also may be interpreted differently depending on the region in which you're operating. Okay, for example, in the United States of America, and I should say there's been uh, an update on this, and I'll talk about that in a second. The FCC has made a recent ruling that will go into effect on May 3rd. And the, uh, the USA considers a wireless power transfer as ISM. However, in many products, such as air fuel magnetic resonance and others, there are radios in the product, Bluetooth radios, Wi-Fi radios, et cetera. Now, these are not ISM devices. They are, in fact, radios. And they must be authorized under a radio uh, regulation. FCC Part 15 Subpart C is for radios, okay? So you need to consider that when you have a radio in your system. On the other hand, wireless power transfer itself is authorized under part 18, which is for ISM equipment, okay? If no communications are present in the wireless power transfer frequency, part 18 is used. Now, the United States considers communication as um, things that do not include in-band modulation for the purpose of load management used only to the extent necessary to enable safe and efficient operation. Okay, this is in KDB 680106 that we talked about, and you can read that in the attachment. Basically, uh, for example, the G standard uses in-band load modulation for the purpose of safe and efficient operation to communicate and manage the load. So in the United States, that is not considered telecommunications. Okay, it can be authorized under part 18. Okay. Um, now, uh, just some of you may ask, well, if I have both a radio and wireless power transfer in a system, how do I authorize under both of these parts? And the answer is usually you'll authorize the radio without operating wireless power transfer system under part 15C, perform all of those standard radio tests. And then you'll turn all of the system on under part 18, including the radio. And you exclude the radio emissions that were tested and everything else falls under that part 18. 
So that's the United States. Let's talk a little bit about the EU because it is in fact different, okay? In the EU, any in-band uh, radio communication or what they call radio determination, which basically means uh, tracking the characteristics, position, or velocity of an object, results in the wireless power transfer system falling under the radio equipment directive, okay? So in this case, any in-band communication falls under red. And that would include, in my opinion, it, the key system in band communication that occurs in that case would result in the EU in the wireless power transfer system being a short range device radio. So it would have different limits. Okay. On the other hand, if it does not have in band communication, such as the air fuel magnetic resonance specification, that uses Bluetooth LE out of band, that would fall under the electromagnetic compatibility directive, and you would also need to meet the low voltage directive, okay? And these are different limits. The EMCD has slightly different limits than the red when considering the wireless power transfer product. So what do these limits actually look like? Let me give you a, a few examples, and I'll run through some of these quickly, but I'm happy to answer questions. Okay, conducted limits are fairly straightforward, uh, and this is a summary slide of conducted emissions. You'll notice that these conducted emissions, these two lines, are the same for most all standards. So FCC Part 15 conducted emissions, this is Part 15B, um, and uh, Part 18, and CISPR 11, so this is often used for ISM equipment in the EU, all of those conducted emissions requirements are the same. And there are two measurements that are taken. One's a quasi-peak, okay, uh, and the other is an average. And um, I, I'm not gonna go into the details about the differences between them, but in essence, if uh, the, the signal is constant and um, then it will, the average and the quasi-peak will be, be very close to each other, if not the same. Whereas if the signal periodically occurs in the frequency domain, then these can be different, okay? So these are the limits that you have to meet for conducted emissions. Radiated emissions, on the other hand, is a little bit different. Radiate emissions, um, depending on the particular uh, part that you fall under in the U.S. or standard that you use outside of the U.S. Uh, will, will depend on uh, the distance at which you make the measurement. And some standards require different distances. Others have, don't have a measurement distance requirement um, or they have a broad requirement. And so you can scale the limits. So this is at three meters. So if you set your uh, loop antenna from nine kilohertz to 30 megahertz, and you're measuring the H field in that range, these are the limits that are required in dB microamps per meter. Okay, you'll notice here that there's a difference in part 18 limits. So if I take a look at these two limits here, they're the same limit, but there's a difference between them. Of, of around um, five to six dB or so. And the difference occurs depending on whether your ISM equipment is operating at a fundamental frequency that is an ISM frequency, like 6.78 megahertz is an ISM frequency. So if your wireless power transfer system is operating at 6.78 megahertz, you get this higher limit in the United States. If it's operating at a non-ISM frequency, so 100 kilohertz, 150, 120, whatever it is, then in that case, you're going to have slightly lower limits that you have to meet. On the other hand, in the EU, for example, and actually many countries uh, utilize CISPR 11 for ISM limits, um, at three meters, you're gonna have this limit. And you'll notice this limit currently only starts at 150 kilohertz. 
That's the current status of this. It, it may change in the future and there's discussion, but at this moment, anything below 150 kilohertz is not measured. Above 150 kilohertz to 30 megahertz has to meet this more stringent limit. You'll notice down here for your reference, this is what we consider sort of the noise floor for uh, the equipment that's being used or the CISPR loop, the loop antenna, antenna that's being used. Um, and that's sort of the lowest that can be measured in uh, peak. If many of you are wondering why there's sudden jump here, uh, then that's caused by a change in resolution bandwidth that occurs at 150 kilohertz. So that, that's sort of a different, more advanced topic as well. But as you change your resolution bandwidth, your noise floor will change also. So now that you understand that in a simplified way at three meters, you should know that at 10 meters is where many standards are specified. Okay, a 10 meter radiated distance for um, nine kilohertz to 30 megahertz measurements. And I've tried to break up this graph so you can see the wide array of things that are in here. For the top three, the blue, the dash blue, and the yellow, this is for ISM equipment. So if you consider your wireless power transfer system to be ISM equipment, these are the limits you're gonna be looking at. Um, and if it's a radio, these other limits are what you're gonna be looking at. So let's consider the differences uh, briefly. We talked about part 18, but this is at 10 meters, so it shifts the limit um, a little bit, right, from our previous measurement. You'll notice it was close to 100 at 3 meters. Now, because we're further away, the limit's going to go down, and it's the same limit because actually these limits are at 300 meters, and it's scaled. Okay, it's, and it's scaled using uh, a standard called ANSI C63.30, which will come out very soon. And when it does, I recommend all of you in wireless power transfer systems buy this standard because this is the standard by which emissions are measured for wireless power transfer systems. Okay, it's the ANSI standard. And so this is ISM equipment. The other ISM equipment you have is in yellow, so that's what we saw before. But at 10 meters, it turns out CISPR 11 doesn't have the 10 minute meter limit specified, but you can measure at 10, 10 meters. So if you project that, and there's reasons because of projection of far field, then it looks kind of like this, this yellow line, okay, out at 10 meters. On the other hand, if your system, wireless power transfer system is a radio, then when you're making the measurements, this is FCC part 15C. So if it's considered a radio in the US, your intentional emission, this is the fundamental and um, sometimes the harmonics as well, depending, it must meet this line. And you'll see as it goes up in frequency, there's a dip here, it comes back up a little bit, and this is the limit that your intentional emission must meet under Part 15C, okay? Um, on the other hand, uh, in the EU for wireless power transfer systems, you have these other limits in pink and purple here, and you can see there are some variances as well, as well as some allowances. These two allowances are at 6.78 megahertz and 13.56 megahertz, interestingly enough, the ISM frequencies um, when the device is even considered a radio. So if there's in-band communication, there's a limit. I failed to mention in the case of um, CISPR 11 and part 18 of the FCC's, ISM bands are unlimited. So you do not have a limit to radiations in those cases, only if it's considered a radio. So beyond the um, 9 kilohertz to 30 megahertz. You have 30 megahertz to 1 gigahertz. And um, I'll just show you this briefly just so you can get a comparison. I won't talk about it a lot. But um, at 3 meters, there are some standards that require 3 meter testing in this case and others that require 10. And you can see uh, at 3 meters, again, part 18, you have CISPR 11, and you have 
Part 15B for unintentional emissions. These are all the emissions that are unintentional, okay? And those are required emission limits. Now, I should note that for FCC Part 18, if you're operating below 30 megahertz, you only have to test up to 400 megahertz. If your fundamental frequency is below 30 megahertz, you test up to 4 megahertz, 400 megahertz. If your operating frequency is below 1.705 megahertz, you only test up to 30 megahertz. Okay? So keep that in mind for ISM WPT systems operating under part 18. Uh, finally, for the radiator the limits for 10 meter test range, you have again part 18, um, same is same rules as before, it depends on your operating frequency. And then you have CISPR 11, which does have 10 meter and 3 meter limits in this high frequency case from uh, 30 megahertz to 1 gigahertz. And you have um, CISPR 11. And you'll notice there's slight differences between them, they're very close, but there are slight differences between them. Now, I should mention that for radio equipment, this uh, in China, China recently re released a proposed limit structure. This is the proposed limit. I don't know that they've made a final ruling yet. That was in February and March where they asked public opinion. Uh, but it follows uh, the EN303417 standard by ETI, which you can look up. Um, and that basically follows what we call the EU uh, 7303 and 7401 recommendations in the, in the EU. Okay, and in essence, these are specified in DBM. Okay, so what I did here is I scaled them to scaled them to the E field in dB microvolts per meter uh, using ideal EIRP calculations. So if you have questions on that, um, you can you can send me some questions or um, take a look at that online. So to kind of wrap this all together. And in understanding these limits and these regulatory issues, uh, what are the processes for these two regions? Well, it's actually pretty straightforward once you've mitigated your design and you meet the criteria. Um, for in the US, you actually have to start by asking the FCC for pre authorization. So you have to make an inquiry, and all of that's detailed under this KDB 680106. And when you make that pre authorization inquiry, they'll give you some guidance on how to start your measurements. You, you make a proposal on how the measurements are to be done. I would recommend, uh, similar to what I shared today, you perform your EMC assessment under those parts, the radios under part 15 C and B, the ISM under part 18, and you perform uh, your RF exposure, EMF assessment, like we talked about in the previous webinar. Once you meet the criteria, you submit that information to the FCC and you follow their direction. They may ask for more information depending on what you submit and how you submit it. Once they authorize your device, you obtain an FCC ID and it's posted in a public FCC database. Okay, so you can read about those rules and how that's done. You can also read about other devices that have been posted. Now, just for your information, I should mention that uh, when you, the FCC has recently released an update to part 18 that will go into effect in um, it, both part 18 and RF exposure rules, actually, and this is important, uh, that will go into effect on May 3rd, okay? Basically, in part 18, they've added the definition for wireless power transfer to clarify that it is an ISM uh, issue, okay? So that makes it real clear. They've also added some RF exposure rules from three kilohertz to 10 megahertz that you need to be familiar with um, as it relates to basic assessment, okay? And previously, the rule started at 300 kilohertz. Uh, now, they start at three kilohertz, okay? For the EU, it's a little bit different. Uh, it's all about declaration of conformity. So this is something that you have on hand. You need to have the appropriate documentation if you're a manufacturer, a distributor, or even importer of these systems. 
Okay, and in a very generalized process, I'll give you the very high level. You basically look at your device. You say, what type is this device? What category does it fall under? You, what kind of risks are there as it uh, pertains to the EU directives? These are the legal requirements. You then determine what directives apply. Okay, and when you determine the directives that apply, this is either the red, in the case of a radio, the radio equipment directive, or the EMCD and low voltage directive. Okay, EMCD focuses on EMC issues. The low voltage directive focuses on safety issues. This is the CE mark that's often talked about, um, whereas red uh, has both uh, safety and um, radio frequency interference issues built into those directives. Okay, so once you've identified the standards, you assess against those standards that are appropriate. Um, there are different standards that uh, exist those in what we call the OJU and those that are not, and there are other standards, and you need to determine what's most applicable. If there are some rules, in certain cases, you may have to um, utilize a notified body and get a notified body certificate, okay? Mostly this occurs when you have a device that falls under RED, the Radio Equipment Directive, and you're not using a standard in the official journal of the EU, then it requires a notified body certificate. Once you have all of this testing done, you generate your own declaration of conformity and you maintain it and you continue to perform risk assessment. Unlike the um, FCC database, there's not a, a database you can go to and see all of those CE products because they're maintained by the manufacturer, the um, distributor or importer. So to kind of close today, I, I know we've gone long, but I hope this has been useful for you. Let me give a summary of the content. We talked about EMC and EMI. We talked about those important steps to success. And hopefully you've come to understand uh, some of the issues related to EMC for design and for regulatory purposes. We've talked about EM disturbances and measurements, the modes and causes of emissions, and I offered you some tips and tricks for succeeding, and we did some um, limit exploration, so I showed you some of the limits. Uh, it, you'll be hard-pressed to find all of these limits in one chart like I showed you today. I'm happy to share that with you. And finally, the authorization process. So with that being said, uh, I know we don't have a lot of time, but if there are any questions I can answer, I'm happy to do so, and uh, online or offline. Thanks, Kai. I hope everybody found it uh, very useful. I certainly did. We have a bunch of questions, and just so everybody knows, typically we end uh, like a couple of minutes before the hour. I think today it seems like uh, we will at least try and get to some of the key questions here. And I'm hoping that people can, uh, can stay around. Okay, Kai, so let's not waste any time getting to the questions. The first question I have, a couple of them are actually on the matching network. So the first question is, does it mean that second order matching network is better? Uh, and maybe it helps to go back to the chart in the beginning of the presentation. Yes, let me do that. So this is uh, the example here. Mm -hmm. So to, to answer that question, um, it's not as straightforward as, as you may think. So this is just one example of many. And it's not always the case that a second order impedance matching network is better. Sometimes it's not. Just to give you one example, if you look at this ideal case, and this is idealized, don't forget that, the third harmonic, which is often um, present or can be seen in uh, EMI, um, is higher in the second order than it is in the first order for this example. Okay, That's not the case for every example. So not only do you need to consider EMI and the harmonic that you're worried about, but you also need to consider uh, what the impact from a functional perspective is. Because, for example, with the second order, some types of second order matching networks, you can get more of a constant current behavior, which is helpful for interoperability. And uh, that's a little more difficult in a first order matching. So 
The answer to that is it depends. And any good EMC engineer will tell you that it depends. <laughs> Generally speaking, high, higher orders are better. Awesome, thank you, Kai. Uh, here's a related question. Uh, if the matching network is a parallel capacitor, uh, how do you achieve a symmetric design? And I'm thinking this is about the conducted uh, common mode. Exactly, okay. So in this case, if for example, your PRU or PTU has a, a parallel capacitor here, you'll notice in the differences between this asymmetric design and symmetric design that the parallel capacitor is identical. So in that case, it, it doesn't really um, make that big of a difference. It, it's the same, but that there's a catch to that. The catch is when you think about common mode emissions, sometimes there are common mode frequencies or issues that exist due to inherent asymmetry. You can never be perfectly symmetrical. So in those cases, you can uh, perform a trick. Now, it usually doesn't work um, if you split the entire capacitance, but it can work um, better in some cases if you split some of the capacitance. And what you do is you split the parallel capacitance into two parts, and then you ground the center part, right? So you're forcing um, basically currents to earth to ground in that case, and you're balancing them yourself. So you're trying to outweigh the parasitic um, imbalance by doing that. So that, that's kind of a trick you can use uh, when it comes to parallel capacitors. Yeah, I'm sure, Kai, that is going to be super helpful to actually some of the engineers here. Uh, here is another interesting question. Uh, we've had conducted emissions issues at the fundamental. Uh, have you seen this in the past and how do you fix it? Yes, I, I have seen this in the past and usually it comes down to one of two things. So. In um, my early testing of conducted emissions, I, I ran systems both at lower frequencies, uh, 250 kilohertz and lower, uh, 6.78 megahertz. And um, I saw two things that happened. One is in a test lab, uh, I actually had a case where the lizen was off to the side and the test setup and had an exposed AC mains to the lizen right here. And because that was exposed, some of the fields from the wireless power transfer system were coupling into the AC mains. They were not actual conducted emissions, okay? And how we determined that is we, we shielded this and we added a common mode filter at the AC mains of the input of the LISM, not what's connected to the device, but on the LISM mains power, which is perfectly allowable because this is supposed to be perfectly filtered, and suddenly the fundamental frequency dropped, okay? That means that it's a setup issue, and a lot of labs may not have experience with that because they're dealing usually with unintentional emissions, okay? So make sure that your lab setup is correct, that you don't have those uh, particular issues, and then once you've done that, you look at the conducted emission, and you say, okay, I still am over the limit, and usually what that means, if you're operating at an ISM frequency, your bandwidth of that frequency is too high. Now, it's a fixed frequency, so why would there be a bandwidth? The, the answer usually is because there's secondary loops, so currents are flowing in places that you don't want. So usually what that means is you need to consider choking or reducing your parasitic. So line length, the AC mains length, can make a big difference between your device and your test. The other thing that's helpful, and this is the first thing I would do if I have conducted emissions problems, is use a shielded AC cable, okay? A shielded AC cable because, again, your wireless power transfer system is coupling directly into these wires. And that is common to both of the lines. And so when you shield it, hopefully you reduce some of those emissions by doing that. Um, then the other thing you can do is add chokes on the AC mains. Uh, 
as well. And um, there are different kinds of jokes. The most effective ones are usually in the device itself. Okay. Now, what I've seen also is that uh, depending on your wireless power transfer system, you'll use a switch mode power supply, an AC to DC converter that is passes emission limits. The, the manufacturer will tell you that. But it doesn't consider the uh, filtering at the frequency that you're operating. So sometimes you may have to add it on the side of the AC mains um, or, in, or consider a different switch mode AC to DC converter. There are a bunch of different things to consider, but start with the setup, then work your way back to a shielded AC mains cable from your device, add chokes and consider where those emissions are coming from and the length of your AC Very good. mains or Thank DC. Thank you, Kai. Uh, here's another question related to emissions, which is in some applications with the site size constraints, it is hard to have symmetric coil geometry. How does one address the common mode emissions in this case? So when the coil itself Good is uh, asymmetrical. Okay, so um, there, there are two uh, answers to that on, on the PRU side. Usually it's not as critical, but it is helpful, okay? On the PTU side, it's more critical. Uh, however, I have seen plenty of asymmetric designs that work. And the way to uh, make it work in an asymmetric coil design is to fundamentally make sure that your self-resonance is high enough, that your electric field is low enough from the device. Okay, because you may have some radiated emissions due to that um, electric field. Okay, so that, that's a, a really good start. Uh, it might uh, require changing the material. It might require changing how the spacing or the thickness of the traces um, and so forth. Of course, with the smaller coils, you naturally will get higher self resonances. So because you're asking about sm smaller coils, um, hopefully you will have to worry less about it than you would for larger coils. Awesome. I, and I really appreciate, by the way, all our attendees uh, going past the time. A uh, couple of questions, uh, Kai, related to part 15, part 18. The first one is for air fuel compatible wireless power devices. Do we need to pass both part 15C and part 18 uh, limits? Okay, so when it comes to part 15C and part 18, uh, yes, for air fuel devices, you need to pass both. However, what passes um, is not the same. So for example, in, in this case, part 15C uh, is for the radio. So the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth LE. Now the Bluetooth LE in an air fuel system operates um, above the the uh, 30 megahertz, right? So automatically you're looking at specifics to, you're not worried about these this blue limit here. You're worried about the operation um, above 30 megahertz to a one gigahertz uh, range, okay? And, and above for the actual radiated emission. And so that is what has to pass part 15C, not the wireless power part. You only test the radio, and your lab will know how to do that. It's a very common thing. Now, once you pass the radio, you're going to be looking at part 18, okay, for the rest of your emissions. So you turn on the Bluetooth LE, and you go through, and you test the part 18 with the wireless power transfer system operating and the PRU plays in full power. And... In that case, the part 18 missions have to be passed. Okay, so, so that's how both of them work together. The radio, part 15C, wireless power transfer the whole system under part 18. Very good, very good. Here's another question related to part 18. How does part 18 conduct a change as it relates to the fundamental or does it change at all? Okay. So part 18, the conducted is the same for all 
for all of these standards. Um, however, uh, I failed to mention this for ISM equipment. The operating ISM frequency, if you're operating in an ISM frequency, and so this would be 6.78 megahertz, 13.56 megahertz, um, 20 something megahertz, and so on, 40 something megahertz, all the even harmonics of 6.78 megahertz, those are unlimited. So you do not have um, in those frequency bands, you have no limit. You do, however, have to stay within those frequency bands. Outside of those frequency bands, you have to meet these limits here. Very good. Thank you, Kai. And I think a bunch of comments are related to great information, very insightful. I hope a lot of uh, our audience found it that way. I certainly did. And maybe that's a good uh, time to close the meeting. You know, this is a topic that we could go on for a couple of hours. Uh, so what my suggestion was, if you still have questions after today's discussion, send them, uh, send us an email and we will try and answer all the emails as many as we can or schedule another session. And just so everybody's aware, we will also have a recording of this available. You will get the link to access it uh, in the next you know, 24 to 48 hours or so. So thank you all for attending today. You know, uh, I, I hope you all found it very useful and uh, we'll see you all uh, next month on another uh, air fuel webinar. Okay, Thanks, thank everyone. you all. Bye.